Well, everything good has already been said, so I'll see you. No, well, uh, no, I, Robert's poetic says you have to say everything, and uh, that you never can. So that's the difficult situation we find ourselves in. Um, but I want to say that um, meeting Robert Kelly was a um, complicated event for me. Um, I met him in mind before I met him in person, but it was some 40 years ago, um, something like that. I was editing a magazine called Stony Brook, and um, uh, I was publishing pretty much everybody around him except him, because I actually hadn't read him, and uh, word got to me that Robert Kelly said, who is this Quasha? Um, <laughs> Publishing all my friends and not publishing me, and I thought, um, well, he's this ignorant guy who doesn't know to tell you work. So I decided to do something about that and started reading a little bit here and there, and then finally I thought, I better make amends. So I called Robert up, and we ended up having an hour long conversation. I think it was at least an hour long. It was one of the very long phone conversations, which was a mind altering experience. I had a mind altering experience like that in talking to Olson on the phone. But I never felt myself inside the poem on a phone conversation, other than in the, in the Olson situation, um, except in talking to Robert. So we then met at, um, a couple months later, uh, or several months later, at Grand Valley State College when we were both participating there. And um, my first sight of him was Robert carrying huge amounts of food from the car into his room. And I realized that that's what poet, poets are hungry people. I mean, <laughs> we, we don't want to be in a room without food. We, don't, we, want to be, we want to be nurtured at all times. And I thought, we're going to get along great. Um, and uh, actually, the conversation never stopped after that, uh, because those of you who have known Robert know that talking to him and being with him is to realize that his um, Work is in the body, it's in the face, it's in the voice, it's in every uh, gesture he makes toward you, that there is a poetics of every moment, and that his work is a work of the poetics of every moment. Um, there are so many Robert Kellys. Um, we've heard about a lot of them today. But actually, there are an un I, I really pretty much have to say there's got to be an unlimited number, because there's an unlimited number of his words, of lines, of pages, of poems, and that's not just proliferation. I mean, the, I actually, in some sense, regret that people think of Robert as a prolific poet, because then the thing comes to mind is that he writes so much that does that somehow mean that it's less great in its detail? Actually, he is the same poet in every line, and I, I never saw that so clearly as, uh, oh, it was just published, let me get this book, uh, just recently. Uh, he, we were dialoguing poems back and forth, and he sent me what he called his dyads, which is the uncertainties, uh, which we produced as a book in record time for this event. Uh, and they are for sale, by the way. Um, and they won't be for sale again, by the way, till the fall, because it's really a fall book. But we got copies out here because I felt this was so important to have this book present for this event. Why? Uh, well, I, I don't, I'm not going to take a, a lot of time here saying what it is, but this book shows a kind of flowering of the poetics um, in which you can see how the way the mind works in every line, in every turn of phrase, is completely there. It's completely there. We talk about how it reverses itself, all the great things that we can say about his work. But the fact of the matter is there is a physical event that actually occurs inside language, and it <clears throat> it's occurring always now and always in the moment. So these many Robert Kellys, I thought, well, instead, um, I'm of the school, as I think Robert is, that one word worth a thousand pictures. And um, so uh, I decided to reverse that for this occasion and um, make, well, if you do video, thousands of frames go by very fast. So it proves that one word, and Robert is talking. So this, it's, it's still true. Yeah. Um, and in, in this little speaking portrait, uh, based on a two-hour conversation, one of which is with me and one of which is with the poet Alana Siegel, who's here, and edited from, from the two conversations. Um, it was my wish to, to, to be able to show how in the actual physical presence, the full poetics is present. Um, you can see that, by the way. Somebody has to do a study of the pictures of Robert on his books, right? <laughs> uh, I mean, there's 
early Robert of the, of the uh, Scorpions period where it's, it's Robert Kelly as Edward Kelly. Or, there's, or the Robert Kelly of a decade or so later in which you have Robert Kelly as Rasputin. Or then maybe a, and it's Robert Kelly as uh, John Le Carre. I mean, I mean it's really, it's the unlimited, you talk about l largeness of literature, it's all in the face, it's all in the face. Well, here we are. Eke homo. <laughs> began at the age of seven to get nearsighted. So I would you know, read and I, everything was mushy, as it somewhat is now, only more so. But they wouldn't let me get glasses till I was about 13. So for five years or so, I felt my way around in the world. They finally got me glasses when the school said, either he gets glasses or he goes to a class for the blind. Because I couldn't see the blackboard. I couldn't really do anything. And I didn't want to learn Braille and all that stuff. I finally got them to work. And the first sight, the first sight, the night I got them, it was a December night, and it was snowing, and I put the glasses on, and he said, now look. And I looked out the window, and I saw snow flakes. I had never seen snow flakes. I'd seen snow as white gush, and you know, vagueness in the sky, but the actual glint of the flakes as they came down still strikes me as one of the most wonderful things I've ever seen, that moment of utter clarity. So I like to be as clear as I can. I, I don't like to be um, soft focus. Why am I not willing to see with the eyes that God gave me, so to speak? And if they want to see close here and vague there, why not let them? I, I wrote a series of poems once called Natural Eyes, in which I took up a poem by somebody else, Keats, I remember starting with, I don't know who else I did, and I put it at the normal reading distance, which is about here, and I took off my glasses and wrote what I saw. And like, you know, some of the words were right, most were wrong. So I transcribed that to how I, by natural eyes, read Keats or Shelley or whatever I was reading. I think, as, as Brackett says, it's very important to, to go with that natural situation of the eye and see how far it takes you. The selfic energy manifests everywhere, everywhere that you look, and your looking makes it manifest. It's your attention to it that elicits the energy from the thing seen. You know that, yes? That it's by looking at it, by your attention to something, that you make something work, that it comes to life. Not by anything casual, not, it's never going to talk to you unless you look at it carefully. And that, again, writing down is about something like that. It's almost the kind of infantile, well, Mr. Table, what do you have to tell me today? I, I will write down whatever, you, whatever comes into my mind while I am looking at that. The sense of being utterly at the mercy of the thing you're looking at. Poetry is nothing but answering, that we'd spend our whole lives answering a question that's not asked. The unasked question is so powerful and we feel compelled to answer it. I do, I mean, I have to write every day. Every day I have to write because otherwise I get somehow psychically sick because I haven't been answering. And maybe someday if I write enough, it won't be that I've answered the question, but I will have been maybe entitled to hear it, whatever that question is. You must think at times of deities and other powers and things beyond our normal everyday perception. And those are hard things to think about, aren't they? They're both alluring and frightening. How nice to have a personal god or an angel or something like that. How terrifying and how interesting and how intimate. Those are good things to think about, but not everybody thinks about them. I think it's interesting that we live in a world where a lot of people never think those thoughts. It wakes us up, it makes us ask questions, it makes us, gives us things to think about, 
and it gives us thinking to think about. It unanswers everything. It, it constantly answers. I mean, all it is is an answer. It's a revelation or an answer. If the poem doesn't tell you anything, you, you, you don't have to bother with it anymore. You write in the hopes that you'll learn something. Or I write in the hopes that I'll learn something from the divine language that runs through me. I mean, the language which is itself divine and that runs through us. The Greeks were, who were foolish in some ways, were not foolish when they, when they spoke of languages having a divine origin. It is God in man. If anything is God in man, it's language. That is so. And it teaches us. So I, I write to learn. I'm sure you do too. Why is it that I so trust desire? And I tried to work it out today with the thought that we trust desire, we should trust desire, because desires are, in fact, radical to our identities in this life or the only life we know. They're radical. I want what I want because I'm me. You know, that's the closest thing I can come to knowing it. I can know who I am by what I desire, by what I'm afraid of. Years ago, I wrote a stupid little poem that said, fear and lust, trust nothing else. Okay. And in that sense, trust, the trust mm. desire, which is not to say indulge it or do it. I think we can consciously know our desires and consciously choose if, if we prefer not to indulge them. But we must know them and trust them and trust them that they are our desires. And the contradiction of guilt is that there is someone outside us saying, no, don't trust your desire. Mm. Don't trust your fear. You shouldn't be afraid of snakes. You shouldn't want to, to do that. You should instead conform to another image built in the world around you. And in the guilt culture that, that I'm familiar with, the world creates images in the form of expectations. That a man like me should do such and such a thing. A man mm -hmm. like you should do such and such a thing. If I'm not living up to that image, that expectation, I am somehow uh, in a state of anxiety, i.e. neurosis. That all of our unhappiness that I know about, apart from that which comes from the physical sickness itself, which in itself, as we know, may arise from mental disorder, all of the things that we usually call unhappiness, I wouldn't say disease, but simply what we call unhappiness, seems to me to arise from a refusal to recognize the difference between what one organically, genuinely, karmically is motivated to want or not want, and on the other hand, the things that we're expected to know. I mean, are um, how am I supposed to be perceived as a great poet if I mm -hmm. instead pick my nose and go to baseball games? You know, mm -hmm. I'm making a joke of it, but mm -hmm. the, the contrast between what we actually want to do and what we think we're supposed to do. And, and that's where I think guilt has its, its function in creating the capitalist society we live in, a society based upon how we're supposed to look to other people. I would, strictly speaking, say that there is, when you enter a poem, writing it, there is a form that begins to manifest. And yeah. as you go through the act of writing it, the form becomes more and more compelling. Yeah. Uh, offers you options and denies you options. And as the form begins to declare itself, and only when it reaches, draws you to its fulfillment of its own form, can the poem be said to be done. I imagine in the same way, if you look at a woman with desire, that that same sort of, there's a formal presence of what it would be like to have a relationship with her. So an inch out from the relationship, maybe we're just going to talk about her poems. Or, no, maybe we're going to go skiing together and then say, what, whatever it may be. But the form is, is building. So without the energy of desire, the form would not even occur to occur. But as it builds, the radical hypothesis of our existence, that we are totally enlightened beings, totally enlightened beings, and we're utter, utter fuck-ups, and each does not deny the other, and each is true, but each is the unsaying or the away-turning of the other. And in that way turning, we get the energy to do something about the situation. Hypothesis is itself a source of energy, mm -hmm. that you're not doing it to be, make some kind of philosophical point, yeah. this is so, but this is so, or not so, or no, it, it's unsayable, or we cannot define the indefinable, blah, blah, blah. But rather that in the act of turning away from what we have said, in turning our back on the proposition, 
whatever that is, God exists, we turn away God. You know, without saying God does not exist, that's no more interesting a proposition than that at first. But in the turning away, we acquire energy, as you would have once said, mm -hmm. torsion, because it's a twist. Mm -hmm. Apophysis is twisting. You're always turning from yeah. something said to something not yet said, from something thought to something not yet thought. Yeah. And the unthought, the, the lure of the unthought, mm -hmm. which we, when we're writing poems, you know, we're, we're realizing that mm -hmm. we are being magnetized by the last line. We're being pulled that the way Dante is pulled to that love that moves the sun and the stars. You can feel that for the whole stupid poem. You can feel that, yeah. that one line dragging him through his yeah. experience. Something like that line. He doesn't know what form it will take, but you can, the magnetic power of the, of the final form is the power of the unthought, which pulls yeah. him. Yeah. What you called the unthought earlier. I like the sense that the intimate is that which is most deeply connected with the structure of reality. And, of course, what I've been thinking about is what everybody else has been thinking about for 6,000 years, is the structure of appearance and the structure of reality, one structure, or are there, are there two different structures? So the way I've been thinking about that lately has to do with prophecy. And that's been interesting to me. How come we know the future? How, which is actually only a specialized case of a stranger question, but the one that we never ask, how come we know the past? How can we know anything about the past? How can we remember? Now, I've been thinking that remembering is actually as weird and as bizarre and as, what's the word I want, uh, new age, a concept as prophecy is. We accept it without ever really challenging it. Why do we remember? What is it that we remember? How can we remember? So I've been thinking about the fractal nature of time, that if I'm right in thinking about the fractal nature of anything, the pattern that we see at the moment is, quote, the same shape, unquote, in a fractal sense, as what was yesterday and as what tomorrow will be. But there are different scales. So the, from the perception of the present, we intuit a past, which we affect to remember, and then we intuit, but probably with the same logistic detail, we intuit a, a tomorrow, a future, but have no confidence at all in what we see there. So I'm thinking how interesting it would be if, instead of thinking of time as an arrow or a line, along which we move, or a circle to which we recur, on which we recur. If we could instead think of time as a structure, a building, an object, even one of those platonic solids that we used to talk about so much when we wanted to have an icosahedron on the table and a dodecahedron in the pocket. Suppose time were a solid, then, a solid into which we move wormhole-wise. I like thinking about that because it brings me to the, the sense of the identity of appearance and reality. It, and it seems to me that I'm talking with a man who knows how to look at a stone. I'm supposed to be giving a reading in March with a man who knows how to go into a stone, Clayton Eshelman, he and I are reading in New York. And Clayton is a man who is brave enough to go into the, the earth who penetrated the interior of the earth without any sense of alchemical um, uh -huh. empressement. I mean, it just went there, goes there again and again. I couldn't. terrifies mm. me, the notion of being inside a stone. Yeah, and you can look at them. You can do more than look. I can look at them and think about them. Clayton can go into them. You can pick them up and float them. You can make them rise and support themselves, dance, so to say. So the stone has been thinking about Clayton reading that I have to give, thinking about your stone, since I knew we'd be talking about you, I realized that the stone is sort of the essence of what we have to consider, time as a stone. As I so need to believe that appearance is reality, despite all the contrarian platonic gestures that we've been making all our lives, that if we can but bring ourselves to gaze at appearance with the same reverence and detail that you gaze at your stones before you say, Arise, sir, <laughs> stand up. 
And you do that. You do that talita kumi to the stone, you know, where Jesus says, get up, little girl, and the dead woman rises up. Uh, So you say to the stone, talita kumi, get up, little girl, or little boy, or old gentleman, or however you address them. I don't know your magic. But you say something to them, and they rise. In that sense, if we can look at all appearance that way, this gear, this wall, this chair, this self, even this head, Mm. to make it somehow, uh, to be so intimately acquainted with it that you let it speak, and that is to say, rise. Because to me, rising and speaking are (laughs) indistinguishable. You wake talking, you know, and uh, you know you're asleep when you stop talking. I'm answering, but it doesn't do the tape any good at all. Except that cameras can read the mind too. Sometimes you have to have to block them out. <laughs>